Hello, I'd like to welcome everyone to today's webinar on understanding and improving honeybee nutrition for sustainable crop pollination and apiculture by Dr. Ramesh Sagili of Oregon State University. I'm your host, Alice Formica of eOrganic. And before we begin, I just wanted to let you know that we have many articles and recorded webinars on organic farming and research on our website at eOrganic.org and on our YouTube channel. We are recording this presentation and it will be available on the eOrganic YouTube channel within one to two weeks. This talk will last about 45 to 50 minutes and then we'll have 30 minutes for questions. If you have a question at any time, feel free to just type it into the Q&A box and I'll be reading them out loud after the presentation is over. So today I'm very pleased to introduce Dr. Ramesh Sagili, who is an associate professor of apiculture in the Department of Horticulture at Oregon State University. His research focuses on how to improve honeybee health, honeybee nutrition, and honeybee pollination. He works together with many beekeepers, growers, other researchers, and the general public who is interested in bees. Hello and good morning. Thank you all for your interest in this topic and uh, attending this webinar. So I'll spend about 45, 50 minutes uh, uh, going over this topic of understanding and improving honeybee nutrition for sustainable crop pollination and apiculture. So uh, before I start, I would like to acknowledge uh, the contributions of all these amazing uh, current and past lab members that you see on the screen. So basically, this is the overview of the presentation. Uh, I know majority of you in attendance today are not entomologists or apiculturists. So I will start with some basic introduction on uh, bee nutrition and then discuss some gaps in knowledge uh, with respect to bee nutrition. Uh, later, I will go over some nutritional challenges facing honeybees and then uh, that the, during the crop pollination scenarios. And then finally, I'll discuss some efforts being made to improve habitat for bees and challenges that are involved with this effort. So that's basically uh, what I'm going to do in the next 45 minutes. Okay, so first let me refresh your memory regarding biotic and abiotic factors impacting bee health. Uh, uh, you all probably heard that colony declines are attributed to uh, multiple factors. Uh, I've listed several of them here. On the top left, I don't know if you can see my cursor, but uh, you see pests and parasites. So basically within those bromite, uh, which is an ectoparasite, is the most important uh, that feeds on the abdominal fat bodies and uh, to some degree on the blood of the bee, which we call hemolymph, and then transmits several viruses as well, which are pretty lethal. And then on the top right, you see I have listed some pathogens, including viruses, uh, bacteria, and then some fungal pathogens, such as or microsporidians, such as nosema. And then uh, this is what I'm going to focus today on, uh, which is uh, poor nutrition. So poor nutrition could result from lack of optimal forage due to monocropping, habitat loss, intensive agriculture. And of course, uh, due to climate change, there might be some floral phenology that is changing as well. And that could also have some mismatch between emergence of bees or foraging of bees and when the plants are in bloom. So, so we'll discuss a little more. Uh, in the next few slides on poor nutrition. And then you have pesticide exposure that I have here. And then uh, uh, you have environmental stressors, which I mentioned as well, climate change. And of course, beekeepers uh, for pollination, they have to move hives, right, from uh, different locations to different crops for pollination. And transportation also has uh, some physiological stress on bees. And there is a lot of genetic diversity discussion as well, which I have not discussed too much today. But uh, uh, you all know that... Uh, uh, the European honeybee is not native to North America. They were introduced probably 400 years ago into the North American continent. So we have some issues with the genetic diversity on how many we, how many species we have here and uh, what type of genetics we have. So again, let's to start with the coming back to the topic of bee nutrition here. Uh, probably you all have heard the adage: uh, "You are what you eat." So this applies to our uh, honeybees as well. So I, as I say here, nutrition is the first line of defense because it helps them defend a lot of stressors uh, that are facing them at this point. And there have been many studies that have documented that optimal nutrition will boost the immune system and also 
helps produce detoxifying enzymes that would help bees detoxify some of those toxins that get into their systems as well. So this slide is just to give you a sense on the levels of nutrition that honeybees have. So uh, when compared to many other insects, especially solitary insects, uh, uh, honeybees have a little bit more complex uh, nutrition. That means we can categorize that into three different levels, not into just one or two, right? So on the top, I have here uh, colony nutrition, there is adult nutrition and larval nutrition, and they may be very different as well. Uh, these larval needs are very different and these are being fed progressively by those nurse bees which are about 7 to 14 years old uh, and, and this is just pure secretions from their glands called hypopharyngeal glands but as adults have needs they are feeding on uh, nectar or honey that is present in the hive that could be that they have collected from the plant resources and pollen is their protein source so they're also collecting pollen so so that all includes their adult, adult nutrition and then colony level nutrition is again big, right? Because there are 40,000 bees at a point of time uh, during spring or summer. And then you have to look at uh, the resources in the hives and there are different uh, caste system in the hive. And there are different uh, uh, tasks that these foragers are performing or the bees are performing in the hive. So based on that, uh, their nutritions might be very different. A forager may not be needing that much protein, but a nurse bee will require a lot of protein. So again, just to give you a sense like uh, Nutrition is not just very simple, it's very complex. Okay, we will uh, continue with the nutrition here. Uh, so these are the three levels I mentioned. And this is a very basic slide for uh, giving you a sense of uh, honeybee nutrition. So on your left panel, you see I listed as macronutrients and then on your right are micronutrients. So basically we have a lot of understanding of macronutrients, but uh, the one I have on the right micronutrients are the ones which we have a huge gap in knowledge. So what these micronutrients are based, so let me go quickly on macronutrients and then I'll uh, spend a little more time on the micronutrients aspect. So, so macronutrients, basically you can categorize into carbohydrates and proteins for bees. Uh, carbohydrates basically would be the nectar and honey that bees will collect and use them for their uh, uh, daily energetic needs. And then uh, pollen, as I said before, is the only source of protein. So they can't get anywhere else uh, the proteins they have to collect from the pollen, right? So, so that's what you see a pollen frame here on the right and a honey frame, which is a carbohydrate source for them. So let's get into the micronutrient part here. So here you can see, I have again, several things here, vitamins, minerals, lipids, and we'll talk more about sterols within the lipids today. Uh, so these are some uh, uh, requirements and, uh, and honeybee has been studied probably for more than 200 years uh, in, a, in a modern world. And still we have huge gap the knowledge regarding micronutrients and and that's what is uh, making sometimes our uh, uh, management of uh, honeybee hives a little difficult because we don't have good understanding of micronutrients so just a recap of this pollen real quick here so pollen as i said is a primary source of protein so bees obtain crude protein and amino acids from this and then all pollens are not made equal so it, think of any cropping system where your bees are or even in the wild uh, pollens are very different in their composition so there may be about 10 to 40%, that's a range of protein in most pollens. And uh, pollens are source of lipids as well, especially the sterols, and I'll talk more about sterols in a second. Again, just to keep you on the same page, so lipids, again, we broadly classify under four, right? Here's the fats, the phospholipids, uh, steroids or sterols, which I'll spend more time on today because those are really important, and then waxes. So to give you a little introduction on sterols, like we all need cholesterol, right? That's an important sterol for us as humans and, and all insects need sterols as well. But unfortunately, they can't make their own sterols. It has to come from their diet. So the role of sterols in insects here, I have listed a couple of them. Uh, they're components of uh, cell membrane and they're also precursors of molding hormones. If you remember from your high school or whenever you, you learned about insects, uh, insects have to molt. And for those molting, uh, you need hormones and we call them molting hormones and I'll go over that in the next slide as well. So all insects, including honeybees, they get their sterols from the diet because they can't make it. So in our case, honeybees have to get the sterols from the pollen. And uh, 24 methylene cholesterol is a very specific cholesterol that bees need in high amounts. And that's a major sterol source and that comes from pollen. 
So here I have just shown that's an honeybee egg that you're seeing on the top. This is a larva that has uh, uh, closed or hatched. And then these are different age groups here. This is a little older one. This may be less than 24 hours old. So these molting hormones I mentioned, these are egg dyson and juvenile hormone. Again, I'm making it very simple here. Hormonal system is very complex, but these are two major molting hormones that are having an interplay so that uh, the insect molts from one stage. So this larva to get to the next stage, they have to have a balance of these. So the juvenile hormone keeps the larva in the same age. That's what juvenile means, young, right? So it keeps the larva at the same age. And when they have to switch to the next, then the egg dyson goes up and this juvenile hormone goes down. So that's an interplay that happens. So these molting hormones are really critical, not just for honeybees, but for all insects. So let me see if uh, this animation plays. It gives you a good idea on what we are talking about, uh, uh, these sterols or the role of sterols in so here is the pollen uh, so we are depicting the sterile as pink dots there so these bees come and they feed on the pollen that they have collected from plant resources and then they will internalize it right so you see those pink dots in the bee as well so they are also these are endogenous stores the bee has internalized those after feeding now she is feeding a larva and then that's how the larva get the sterile as well, because they're getting through that uh, food food that the bees are feeding. And so that's a normal development of a bee. So because the sterile is available, but beekeepers also feed protein supplements uh, at certain point of the year when there is a pollen dearth. So this is again, not a great example, but I'm just showing because there is no sterile in the artificial diets. So now the bee hasn't gotten any of those pink dots or sterols. So she's not able to feed that sterile back to the larva. So the larva may desiccate, it will not molt, because as I said before, no sterile, no molting hormones. So that's the reason why they are not getting that. And the bees will remove or cannibalize this uh, uh, dying larva or the larva that is not able to get to the next phase. So, so there's a lot, as I said, there's a lot of gap in knowledge. Most of the bee nutrition work was uh, done uh, in 80s and 90s. So we have picked up in the last five years, uh, my lab focuses, as Alice said, on three different areas, including bee health, nutrition, and pollination. So nutrition has been a major focus for the last five years. And there are at least uh, three or four other labs in the United States that are focused on uh, improving the knowledge of uh, bee nutrition, because we still have uh, uh, a lot of gaps in knowledge. Uh, during, uh, regarding the requirements of bees uh, in terms of sterile. So, so this is one study I'm going to quickly go over to give you a sense uh, how we do these studies and how this may be helpful in coming up with a more balanced diet for the bees in the future. So 24 methylene cholesterol, if you remember still, that's the major sterile that uh, bees need. So here we wanted to look at uh, or examine the dietary sterile requirements of honeybees. So this is a published study. If you're interested, uh, you can just look for this. Uh, I think it's an open access, so you should be able to get access to this. So here is the experimental design. So we had uh, uh, five, uh, six total treatments, including control. So you have these different concentrations of, so we made these different concentrations. We know a, a limit, we know insects have somewhere max, this is a range. And so we wanted to look at if honeybees have a, a certain point where uh, we could stop and uh, uh, say that this is the perfect diet in terms of sterile. So, so these are different levels, 0 0.1, 0 0.25, 0.5. So these are uh, uh, percentages of total dry weight of the diet. And this is the cholesterol that we made a synthetic diet. Again, there is a formula if you want to read the manuscript if you're more interested in that. So quickly, the results here. Uh, you can see, I'll just walk you through the most important ones here. So we did this for three weeks. So you can see this is the first week diet consumption. So on your right on this uh, bar, so you see these are the high concentrations, right? This is your S5, which is 1% sterile diet. So most of the high concentrations, there was a high consumption. So that, that uh, refers to, or at least it, uh, we, we infer from this study is that uh, the bees are able to recognize uh, the sterile in the diet and they're selectively consumption of those diets that have higher sterile content. So we also look at this mean head protein because there are two important glands in the head of the honeybee, the brood food I mentioned before, the hypopharyngeal glands in the head and the mandibular glands in the mouth parts are the ones that are 
producing the brood food. Uh, these are exocrine glands, so they can regurgitate the food that they have produced and feed the larva. So we looked at uh, if there is a correlation between head protein because of the sterols, and you can see some of that here, the high concentrations, these are significantly different from control and the lower concentrations. So we also looked at abdominal lipid content as well. Uh, so we take the, the abdomens and look for the lipid in those and you can see there was no significant difference in high concentrations but they were significantly different from controls and the low concentrations of sterile diet. So uh, this is a tricky one probably you can't see that well but if you see the top this is a survival curve here you can see that orange bar on the top that's your S3 which is 0.5 percent sterile diet. So so it appears that the survival is better not on the high concentration, but somewhere around 0.5%. So these are some conclusions from that study. So bees consume larger quantities of diet uh, uh, with the higher 24 MC, which is 24 methylene cholesterol. And higher survival, as I mentioned before, was observed in this 0.5% concentration of uh, 24 MC. So this is another study which might be useful as well for uh, the future uh, honeybee diet improvements is uh, we also wanted to establish a protocol because there was none when we started this work. Uh, there is no lab that was looking at uh, uh, analyzing sterols, uh, plant sterols uh, or phytosterols uh, that are required for bees. So we have established some protocols here. Uh, this is a study mostly describing the protocol. So if you're interested in this, again, it's an open access journal too. So sterile profiles, uh, we use this method, uh, LCA, PCI, MRM method, and then we did uh, five commercially available crop pollens, and uh, then we looked at three corbicular pollens. When I say corbicular pollen, that's a bee-collected pollen on the hind legs. The pollen baskets are called corbicular, that's why we mentioned them as uh, corbicular pollens. And we also tested a uh, couple of vegetable oils because some beekeepers mix vegetable oils and the protein supplements, the synthetic or artificial diet they provide. Me. So we wanted to see if we can even detect any sterols in those as well. And of course, a uh, commercial protein supplement that is sold uh, in the market as well. So again, I'll not go too much into this, but I just, uh, uh, I'm showing you one slide with uh, two different sterols here. So this is the sterol that is important for us. So so you can see these are some, this is almond pollen, this is apricot, um, and this might be cherry. So we have all these crop pollens here as well. And you see most of them have uh, a decent amount of 24 methylene cholesterol uh, when compared to your synthetic diets or commercial diets that are there. So again, this is just a, a methodology that we were trying to develop so that we can uh, test sterols in the future. So some of you probably recognize this uh, protein supplement that uh, commercial beekeepers feed. Uh, this is really important, especially when there is uh, a foraging dearth. So as I said before, pollen is the protein source for bees. And if you don't have enough pollen, then bees, uh, beekeepers have to feed at least for that month or two months of uh, the pollen dearth some protein supplements so that the colonies can keep going. The population doesn't decline too much. So it's not a perfect thing uh, because as I showed you before, all the micronutrients probably are not there, but at least it provides them crude protein for sure. So these are some protein supplements that you see that are being fed to bees and hives. So the ultimate goal, as I said, you may be wondering why I'm showing all those uh, sterile studies, uh, just to show you that there is a huge gap in knowledge and requirements of micronutrients and uh, any knowledge uh, that can be uh, advanced in the future can be used to improve these protein supplements. So maybe whoever is manufacturing these can uh, improve by adding some of the sterols that we talked about or, or fatty acids that I'm going to talk in the next few slides. So I'm going to go into a couple of other studies. As I said before, uh, uh, ours is one of the labs, but there are several other labs that are looking into honeybee nutrition as well. So this is another uh, study that has shown uh, that uh, nurse age worker honeybees, they consume foods to achieve a ratio of uh, 1 is to 2 and 1 is to 3 for essential amino acids to lipids. So there is a ratio, again, you need, don't need to understand everything, but, but there is a ratio as well. Not just those lipids are important, but then there are ratios between proteins and lipids, carbohydrates and lipids. So, so it's very complex. And that's why if you remember the first slide I showed you, honeybee nutrition is very complex. It's not that straightforward that we can just make a diet and you can say this is great and the bees will do really well. 
So this is another study that uh, has looked into this fatty acids, uh, which are basically this omega-6 and omega-3 fatty acids. And uh, they are really important uh, in associative learning. And uh, probably you heard of associative learning before. That's very important for uh, bees as well, because they have to forage uh, to, to go to a location to find resources based on the dance language. That's a very, very intriguing thing that is performed in the hives. And the sisters are telling other bees to go to a certain location, certain direction and distance. So that associative learning is really important for honeybee foraging and their colony growth and development. And omega-6 and 3 acids have been shown to be associated with that uh, learning ability of bees. And, uh, and some studies have uh, speculated that the monocultures so that we are exposing our bees to in some scenarios, uh, because as I said before, not all pollens are made equal. They are very different in their composition. So if uh, because of being in a monoculture or somewhere there is nothing else uh, blooming at the time, so there might be a unbal or an imbalance between these omega-6 and 3 diets, and that could impact their learning and memory, and that could impact eventually their colony growth and development. So uh, this is an important one. Uh, I know many of you are probably either uh, producers or researchers that are involved with the crop production. So uh, probably this might be the most uh, um, relevant uh, slide for you. So nutritional challenges facing honeybees during crop pollination, these are three major things that you can think of. So there could be lack of pollen abundance. That means when I say abundance, it's basically quantity of pollen coming in and lack of pollen diversity. Because as I said, the bees uh, they do have to have a large diversity. That's why when you sit next to a hive, you will see different colors of pollen coming into the hive and on their hind legs because bees are foraging on several different resources given that they have that many available. Uh, so pollen diversity is important. Some studies have shown that pollen diversity also is really critical for the growth and development. And then lack of pollen quality. So when I say quality, it's basically again those things that I mentioned before, the crude protein levels and amino acids present in them. So that constitutes the pollen quality. So I'm just giving you one example. In many hybrid crops we see, uh, they don't produce that much uh, pollen and nectar, uh, and that's a quantity issue. But then the quality also, if we test those pollens, uh, we don't see crude protein levels more than 10%, which is on a lower end. So, so that could also result in a, a problem for bees if the quality is incorrect. So, so here I'm just gonna go over a study that we did a few years ago, just to see uh, or assess the diversity and abundance of pollen in some cropping systems. So here uh, we're mostly focusing on the crops in the Western United States. So I'll show you the crops here. Uh, these are the ones, almonds, blueberry, carrot, cherry, and meadow foam. Uh, and then you can see on the top, I just uh, took one uh, snapshot of a figure of a, of a figure from the study. So here you can see almond. So we looked at the diversity, right? You can see how many mean number of plant tax are in that pollen. So we use these pollen traps. Pollen traps are uh, installed on these hives and we make the bees go through a mesh of a pollen trap where the pollen loads will drop and they will be collected in a tray and then you can collect at regular intervals based on your experimental design and then you can analyze those or, or, or do some uh, uh, either microscopic analysis or acetolysis there are ways to do pollen analysis and then figure out how many plant tax are there in that pollen collection. So again Imagine almonds, it's a monocrop, right? To those who have seen almonds in bloom, there's nothing else uh, except for a few weeds, maybe some wild mustard and some dandelions. But so that's the reason, no surprise, you say only three other species or total three species, uh, uh, plant species in that pollen collection. Whereas in blueberry, there is a large uh, diversity, you see about 13. But I'll come back to that. Diversity doesn't always mean uh, this blueberry is a great uh, resource for bees. Uh, carrot is 11 and then cherry 8 and metaphone over 13. So that's the reason I didn't just put the diversity here, but we have uh, the quantity of pollen that is coming in as well, grams per colony per bee. So let's uh, take this example of blueberry. There's a large diversity, that's great. But then you see the amount of pollen coming in is low. And sometimes that's uh, also, you can have a good correlation there. And blueberries are, because blueberries are not uh, uh, an ideal um, uh, crop for bees because it's a bell-shaped flower, especially honeybees, they have a shorter tongue when compared to bumblebees. So they really 
only the nectar foliars are trying to get some nectar from blueberries, but mostly the pollen is collected from something else that is in bloom around blueberries. So we see a lot of different weed species coming in, like scotch broom here in Oregon. So, so that's the reason why you see a diversity, but then we should not uh, be confused. Diversity doesn't always mean just look at diversity and say this is a great resource for bees, but you have to look at how much pollen is coming as well, right? The quantity matters as well. So that's what I'm trying to make the case is both pollen diversity and abundance are important for bees. So you probably have heard a lot about habitat improvement for bees and there have been efforts since uh, 2014. There was, uh, I believe it's 13 or 14 during the Obama administration, there was a presidential memorandum to uh, improve bee habitat. And there were several federal agencies, they were given directives to improve federal, uh, wherever the federal land was to improve habitat for bees. So, so there have been a lot of efforts uh, uh, to improve bee habitat for the last few years now. Probably you see some of these signs around your neighborhoods and uh, the places where uh, there is pollinator habitat development effort in even backyards or uh, the front lawns. And then this is some example I just chose from one of our Oregon uh, crops here. That's a hybrid crop and uh, we are trying to uh, convince farmers to plant something like a hedgerow around carrot so that uh, because hybrid carrot is not a great resource for bees in terms of pollen and nectar. So having some hedgerows of an alternate supplemental forage would really help uh, uh, colony health. So that's another effort. So, so these are some efforts that are going on in different states as well. So this is just another uh, shot of the same slide that I showed you before, supplemental forage for bees during the hybrid carrot seed pollination. And then we have done some work even in almonds. So you see the background here, if you see my cursor, that's the almond crop, uh, still not yet in bloom. This is probably sometime late January. Uh, almonds bloom somewhere around February, first week or so. Uh, so this is uh, an effort where uh, some nonprofits like uh, Project APSM have been uh, uh, trying to disseminate seed for farmers. So this is type of uh, uh, mustard rapini uh, where they have planted for bees. Because bees go even before almonds start blooming. So when they are in California, like there is about probably uh, 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 2 million hives that go for pollination from different states. And they are just sitting in this barren environment where they don't have any access to other foraging resources until almonds bloom. So some farmers have been planting these for bees uh, so that bees have something for those couple of weeks before almonds start blooming. Or even after almond bloom, there is not much. So if this resource is available, that would be a great thing for both beekeepers and farmers. So, so value of uh, the supplemental forage, you know, as farmers, sometimes farmers may be thinking, wow, this is a great uh, uh, idea, but then it comes with a uh, lot of work. And uh, so I'll go into that slide in, uh, in, in a minute. Uh, but uh, let's talk more about the value of supplemental forage, right? So it, it improves bee health, so the beekeeper benefits from this. Then it also increased crop yield. And some people may be skeptical, how would that increase crop yield? Because you're putting some alternate forage and you're distracting bees to a different uh, uh, crop or some alternate forage, and that might reduce pollination. So I'll, I'll, I'll try to give you more insights in the next slide. But uh, what we have seen is a win-win for both beekeepers and growers if there is some supplemental forage. We're not talking about if you have 10 acres of blueberry or almonds or cherries or whatever crop you're talking about. Uh, it, we are looking at only a small acreage, maybe one fourth of an acre for a 10 acre land uh, with a crop. So, so I'll give you some uh, insights on that here. So, so first thing is, uh, again, to convince a farmer, I know sometimes it's hard because they are already paying uh, a, a significant amount for pollination uh, as a rental fee for those hives. And on top of that, if you ask them to plant something for bees, it's a lot of work and expense for them. So, so at, at least uh, this slide makes them understand that this is really critical. And it's, as I said before, it's a win-win for both beekeepers and farmers because optimal nutrition, what happens? Let me walk you through this slide here. On the left, I'm saying optimal nutrition. That means there is adequate pollen in the hive and that will stimulate the queen to lay eggs, right? And that's how you see this larva. So greater number of larva means they are releasing a lot of pheromone. So that's how the larva communicate to the adult bees is by sending that pheromone on, from their bodies that is released and then bees are able to perceive the pheromone. So they can tell maybe there is 1000 larva today, there is 2000 larva tomorrow. So they will because the threshold of this pheromone changes 
based on how many larvae are there in the hive, right? So, so that's how these bees are getting the cube, adult bees, and that's how they start foraging for resources, both pollen and nectar. Especially uh, even uh, some of the studies we have done in the past have shown that brood pheromone is the major one that elicits pollen foraging. So you see the pollen foragers that are trying to go more or they make more foraging trips and they're collecting more pollen. So that what happens is when you're stimulating them with this brood pheromone from the larva, so you will expect more bees on the flowers or the crop. And that would increase your yield, right, because of increased pollination. So that's basically the story behind it how this biology of the bee works. And so that's how we have been uh, trying to convince farmers as well is uh, if you have a small acreage, then I think that's really going to benefit both crop pollination as well as the bee health. Because otherwise, the queen will stop laying eggs after some time because she's not seeing any pollen coming in or there's no stimulus for the bees to go and forage. So that would impact pollination eventually. So having some alternate forage definitely will help. So here are some limitations uh, for those who, uh, uh, farmers especially, uh, or growers who are interested in planting. You know, these are some challenges that we have discussed with our farmers here uh, in Oregon as well. They, they are interested in planting, but they, they come across all these limitations. The first thing would be land, right? We want to spend a little more land on planting something for bees. So that's another expense and uh, an income foregone, I believe. And then irrigation, some of those uh, recommendations, again, I don't have any recommendations for all states. I'm just saying we have to figure out what those are. We have tried several species here in Central Oregon for bees uh, because they have to match, right? That's what I'm saying here, matching bloom. You don't want uh, something to bloom uh, when the bees are gone because the bees may be there in the crop for pollination for only a month. And after that, if it starts blooming, there is no value to that. There will be value for the bees that are still there, maybe like some bumblebees and other native bees, but for especially honeybees that the beekeepers are bringing in, they may not be able to take advantage of that. So, so that's a challenge. So we have been testing several uh, crops, uh, at least uh, not just crops, but other species as well, like forage, facilia, and uh, some clovers and other stuff too, uh, in Central Oregon to see if we can match the bloom with the carrot seed crop so that the bees can take advantage of both. Uh, irrigation could be an issue depending on what you recommend these growers to grow uh, for supplemental forage for bees. And then weed management could be an issue. It may be. And some of these uh, uh, suggestions that we may come across may become a weed as well, like clover, is notorious, right? It can take over a lot of land if not managed well. So, so there are issues that we need to think about in terms of weed management as well. And finally, the concern uh, is regarding decrease in target crop. This is a common question probably everyone will get, right? If you uh, suggest some supplemental forages, I'm paying $110 or in almonds $200 for a hive for pollination. Then uh, if we are planting some supplemental forage, would it not distract bees from the target crop and then uh, reduce our pollination. So, but again, if you remember the slide I showed you before, uh, we are not looking at a large acreage. We are looking at a smaller acreage where the bees are still able, they are still stimulated because there is still pollen coming in. But otherwise in two weeks, like the hybrid carrot seed crop I mentioned, uh, the bees just decline, the colonies decline in two weeks because the queen stops laying eggs because there is no stimulus uh, because they're not getting enough resources into the hive in terms of pollen. So uh, I found this uh, re very recent study, maybe it was a couple of months ago, this uh, came out and uh, so here uh, what they did is it's soybean crop. So soybean technically you don't need bees for pollination of soybean, but uh, these authors have shown that uh, there is a benefit for having the, uh, a pollinator habitat next to a soybean crop as well. So they have seen that soybean, uh, even though bees are not actively going there, but uh, if there is something else, you may not see that many bees in soybean, but at least wherever they had this pollinator habitat strips around the soybean fields, uh, they saw that, uh, uh, that's what I say here, the presence of pollinator habitat adjacent to soybean fields had a positive effect on some yield measurements such as seed weight. So again, uh, they also measured a lot of diversity of bees and they found, again, that's a known thing. Uh, but this was very interesting in a crop that is not really dependent on bees for pollination. They could see some uh, uh, increase in uh, yield parameters, uh, such as the seed weight that you see here on the top here. here that's what they measured the, the seed weight per plant uh, was significantly different. 
So it looks like I have probably a few more minutes. So I'll go into some of these uh, B-friendly certification programs. Uh, I'm not sure if you all have heard of these, but again, it's something related to improving bee habitat uh, for especially related to growers. So all these growers, uh, um, again, as I said before, it's not just a, a good thing for their pollination, but there are uh, some consumers now that are interested in, uh, uh, in, in bee health because bee health has been a big topic for the last 15 years at least now. And so they all want some certification so that they can showcase that uh, uh, they are uh, promoting some uh, bee friendly practices uh, and that's how they're producing their crop or whatever their product is eventually. So there are two, one, two programs that come to my mind here that I have uh, mentioned here, the Bee Better Certified, which is from Xerxes Society, which is a, a nonprofit invertebrate conservation group here in Portland. And then uh, uh, Bee Friendly Farming is another group. Uh, it's a uh, pollinator protection. Uh, it's uh, called P2. Uh, it's based somewhere in DC, I believe. So, so they they have this. Uh, if you so I copy pasted some of the language that they need for certification. So, if you are a farmer, if you do all these three things, then you'll be certified with this uh, B better certification, and that probably improves your uh, sale or whatever uh, your product is eventually. So. So what it requires is basically have a minimum of 5% of your land dedicated to bee habitat and then provide nesting habitat such as some undisturbed ground or some uh, these stems uh, that means leaving some of those uh, uh, plant species that bees uh, really use for nesting and then protection from pesticides. So having some sort of a IPM strategy where they have a comprehensive pest management strategy that includes monitoring for insect pests and also using non-chemical practices. Probably uh, most of the audience here is related to organic production. So you may have related this something very closely to your operations. So these are some things probably can be easily done in a more of an organic setup because you probably are very mindful of uh, some of these uh, uh, pesticide applications. So again, similar requirements for this bee friendly farming group as well, uh, having some planting uh, pollinator food resources, providing nesting habitat and incorporating an IPM strategy. So here uh, I'll switch gears and uh, talk about a project again, something really related to the bee nutrition component here. Uh, so probably you heard uh, there is a lot of enthusiasm about planting uh, plants for bees because of that habitat development. I get a lot of questions every year from uh, stakeholders that are interested in planting for bees. And there are plant lists, right? If you look on the web, you'll find a lot of listings of plants uh, uh, that are based basically not on empirical research, but based on the visitation rate. So, so we got some funding from USDA last year to look uh, or develop a pollen nutritional composition database. So basically what I'm saying here is basically right now, they are all selecting plants based on attractiveness, right? That's what we know. If someone says lavender is attractive because they see a lot of bees coming on to lavender. But what uh, I'm trying to argue here may not be a great analogy of French fries here, but just uh, bear with me. So if you don't have a choice and if you do just French fries type I mean this is a plant species that your bees have, either lavender or something, and yeah, they will be going on that, right? So so for me, if you give choice, I may start foraging on this. That doesn't mean that uh, French fries are best for my health, right? So same thing for bees. We need to know the composition, nutritional composition of pollen uh, to make sure that uh, just attractiveness is not your criteria. So that's what we are trying to see is we can do some more empirical uh, data collection here so that uh, that can go along with those plant lists. So that's a basic idea behind this. So you can see here, this is an NRCS website, Natural Resources Conservation Service. So they have all this excellent information on plant species. You can read about the PDFs on uh, when you can plant them and how you can plant them and all that information is great. But wouldn't it be great if you have some more information like having, that's what I added here. So this is a Zerci Society uh, plant list here as well with the same information on a lot of the things that are required for uh, before you choose a plant for planting in your backyard or even near your crop. So what we are looking in this grant is uh, trying to get this pollen nutritional composition data, just not crude protein, but all the phytochemical sterols that I mentioned before. So it will be a comprehensive uh, uh, database where you can go and say, okay, I'm picking this uh, riverbank lupin 
uh, what is the content in there. So I think that would give them a more a robust uh, uh, way to pick plants rather than just uh, based on the track. Theory. That's a whole. Thing. So here is a video we made uh, for uh, the citizen scientists. So please watch this and. Uh, Okay, so that was uh, basically to collect uh, pollen using bees, uh, but uh, I think our major priority is collecting uh, by hand, that means manual collection and yeah, we have been uh, uh, trying to figure out ways to collect because each plant species flower is different, right? So uh, based on their morphology and how much pollen they produce, the floret size, so it's been hard, but uh, we want to, so we're designing a vacuum uh, device where we can suck pollen with some filters. And so it's still an ongoing process, but uh, for some uh, plant species where it's hard to collect uh, manually with hand with a vacuum device, then we want uh, citizen scientists to use uh, the honeybees because honeybees have this floral fidelity, right? That means they, they forage on the same plant species for the entire day or the entire week, unless it's gone. So they have this uh, consistent uh, visitation rather than going into two or three different species at the same time. So yeah, so that's why you see in that video, it's only honeybees. Uh, we don't want to capture any bumblebees and other species, uh, but just honeybees after watching them on the flowers a few times and looking at their hind legs, if they're collecting pollen, then you can capture again. Uh, if you're interested, uh, please email me and uh, we'll send you more uh, uh, guidelines and directions on how to approach and so this is a two-year project so so we can collect even next year as well if you're interested and uh, and then yeah i think that's the whole goal we have a list of about 100 plants uh, that we target uh, during this two-year period from now on so here uh, i just wanted to acknowledge all the support that we have received for our research program for the last uh, 10 years or plus now and I think uh, I probably have uh, time for questions. Um, so we do have some questions now coming in. Um, and uh, I'm just going to start and um, put them in order here. Let's see. I know the first one was just about um, something that you mentioned. Um, what is corbicular pollen? So corbicular pollen is the pollen that is collected by honeybees. Uh, they have these pollen baskets on their hind legs. So you can see them collecting pollen when they go back to the flowers and come back to the hive. You'll see a load of those pollen balls hanging on their hind legs. So that's what the corbicula is a scientific term we use for the pollen baskets on their hind legs. Oh, okay. Yeah. All right. And what is the time lag between egg laying to hatching in foraging bees? So... So I don't know if foraging bee is a term associated there, but yeah, it's a queen lays an egg. It takes three days to hatch or eclose. That's a more uh, entomology term we use, eclosion. So, so three days and then, uh, so it totally is for a worker is 21 days since a queen lays an egg until you see a bee coming out of her cell. It takes about 21 days and it's different for queens. It's 16 days and 
for drones, it's about 24 days, which are the males. Okay. Um, let's see. The research you cited indicated that almonds have a good, deal more, a good deal more pollen than some other flowers. Does that also indicate a relatively lower or higher micronutrients in almond pollen? Yeah, great question. So we have looked at crude protein for sure. So the crude protein levels are relatively high. So all your tree fruits like apple, pear, cherries, we find around 25% crude protein, but almond is about 29% crude protein. But we haven't looked at other, ster I mean, sterols also. Yeah, we have looked at 24 methylene cholesterol, which is significantly high compared to some other uh, nuts and fruits. Uh, but we haven't looked at other composition like omega-3 fatty acids. And so, yeah, we need to know. But uh, yeah, as far as I know, the crude protein levels and the uh, 24 methylene cholesterol levels are significantly high. And that's why if you talk to beekeepers that uh, take their hives for almond pollination, bees do really well. And uh, they come very strong when they come back to their respective states after pollinating almonds in California. Okay. Um, now, this is a question related to your, your comment about mono, monocultures. When purchasing honey, is it best to avoid honey from a monocrop like clover honey or blackberry honey? Uh, I would not say that's uh, something to avoid. Uh, 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 monocropping, I was saying, is probably not great for bee health. And like, see, almond is okay because it depends on the type of uh, uh, cropping system or crop we are talking about, right? So almond has been an okay crop. It's not imposing any problems. Uh, but some crops, yeah, they may have like hybrid carrot if you have thousands of acres of that probably your bees will decline pretty soon. Uh, the colonies will be half the size in, in probably a month. Uh, but with honey production, that's a different question. Uh, so sometimes uh, if you are in a more monofloral uh, condition like clover, maybe white clover or red clover or whatever you're thinking about, a larger acreage gives you a little more definitive sense on uh, whether that honey is pure from that crop. I mean, bees forage for several things, as I said before, right? So they're not just going on to one crop all 40,000 bees in a hive are not going to forage on one crop. They will have, that's why they bring in different pollens and different types of nectar as well. So, but there is a more of an assurance if you are in a large acreage with a monocrop, maybe that honey is from mostly from that because beekeepers and uh, whatever, wherever you buy your honey, uh, you see that they are labeled as clover or meadow foam or some, some other crop. Uh, but uh, they are not 100%, right? It's only probably max you can find is 50% of the main source or the primary source that they are foraging on. So I don't know if I answered the question, but uh, uh, it, it's not something uh, uh, detrimental that you are getting honey from a monofloral source, uh, but it's more for a problem for bee health if they are on a monocrop because they are probably are uh, not able to get all the other requirements they need in terms of uh, pollen nutritional composition or nectar. Okay. Um, let's see. Does industry need to work on affordable bulk sterile for pollen substitute manufacturers? I understand sterols are very expensive. If so, is industry aware of this need? Yeah, great question. I don't think I have a great answer, but I'll try my best here. So, uh, so the 24 methylene cholesterol uh, I, I showed you for our study, it's really expensive and so we were looking at the Sigma catalog and others where we get our research supplies, right? The chemicals, and none of them had this 24 methylene cholesterol listed on their catalogs because no one really looks for that. So, so when we asked, they said, we don't have. So we had to uh, look for, uh, there was a Canadian company that was able to custom synthesize. There are multiple steps to get the sterol that we need, the 24 methylene cholesterol. So it was very, very expensive. We paid $80,000 for 10 grams, which is barely anything. That's why we did a cage study, because if you do a field study, you have to spend more of it. So, uh, so, so yeah, it's a great question. It's very expensive. So what we are trying to see basically is, uh, I don't know if the industry can come up with a, a strategy to produce something uh, like what I mentioned about custom synthesis in a lab and uh, unless you reduce some of the steps, that would be great. But there are other sources like your pollen is a natural source for some of these, but only thing is we have to see what are those sources. Like almond, I said, is a higher concentration of 24 methylene cholesterol. So maybe right now the choice is to only figure out uh, the, the plant species that have 
higher concentration of uh, 24 methylene cholesterol and maybe somehow collect that pollen and use it for uh, uh, or mix it in the diets that uh, are being uh, fed. But I think that could be an ultimate step. The final step, yeah, if there is a way to extract 24 methylene cholesterol uh, from either, there are some algae as well, right? That they are good source of uh, uh, 24 methylene cholesterol. But just you can't feed these algae because you don't know how you have to look at the digestion and assimilation of those things for bees as well. We can't just feed anything to bees and expect they're able to digest and assimilate. So, so there are some ways we are thinking uh, maybe in the future, but yeah, uh, whoever is asking this, it's a great question. If you have any ideas, let me know, but uh, we are trying mostly to see if there is a way we can uh, uh, figure out with plant sources, with the pollen itself right now, uh, not going the synthetic way. Okay, I'll just turn on my video here too, make it a little more friendly. <laughs> um, we have a few people that are curious about your citizen science project and whether you're only interested in recruiting people from the Pacific Northwest or perhaps also from the Midwest. We have someone interested from there. And then we also have someone in Saskatchewan, Canada, um, who's interested in some of the pollen quality of their native and introduced pollinator plants. Yeah, no, no, great question. So, no, we are not restricted to Pacific. This is a USD and national grant we have. And so we did a training program for some interested citizens, I uh, think a um, few weeks ago. And so I have a video recording and all I can share that with you. So now we are looking for pollen from anywhere from North America, including Canada. So you can send us, they have directions on how to uh, ship them to us. And there are some more directions in the video. I just showed you very quickly today but uh, there is a longer video that you can watch and uh, uh, and and then decide how you can help um what is the nutritional research relating to mycelium extracts so is the question about uh, uh, something uh, a different study done at wsu can we be a little more clear on what the Okay, um, Ryan, if you could clarify that question, but he had another question in the meantime. Um, so, um, and he was wondering what the best nutrition is for bees in Hawaii. Uh, great question. You have to tell me, I'm not familiar with the Hawaii uh, environment on what blooms at what time of the year, but yeah, if you send me, yeah, so I have my email typed in the chat so you can, uh, uh, you can email me and tell me what blooms at different times and I can at least give you some insights on uh, uh, whatever work we have done. If we have done anything on those specific uh, floral species, I'll be able to comment. But uh, but yeah, I think, uh, again, as I said, bee nutrition is really a, a very understudied area and we're still trying to figure out things. So, so yeah, give me your plant list and I'll be able to tell you which might be the best ones among those. Okay, yeah, I was wondering too, I mean, are there any existing lists right now that have the nutritional components of pollen? Because, uh, I mean, you mentioned that a lot of them mainly focus on the visitation of bees yeah. and how frequently bees yeah. visit, but yeah. is there anything now that's out yeah. there? So, so the only uh, thing that comes to my mind is nothing in North American uh, region, but uh, in Australia, there is a publication. If you type in fat bees, skinny bees, F-A-T, fat bees, skinny bees, and you could find a PDF but that was done in Australia. They don't have any sterols and other things, but they have basically crude protein levels. Uh, probably some amino acids are listed. It's not comprehensive, but there is some information for sure. Uh, but yeah, if you can relate something to what is grown in Australia, probably that might be relatively closely aligned to what we have here. But but that's the only publication, fat bees, skinny bees from Australia. Okay, great. Um, Ryan said he would email you um, about the mycelium question. So um, let's see, um, by using pollen traps on hives for the study on pollen colors collected, could that possibly change the quantity of pollen that bees will be foraging for as they are not able to use most of the pollen that they're collecting? Yeah, uh, another great question. So yeah, so we can, so some people try, this is not good for bee health if you're trapping pollen too long. So let me give you two different uh, insights here. So this is for a study. So we had we don't have a choice. Right? That's where you put traps and you collect on a, on a weekly interval. So we don't trap more than a couple of days. That's a max because bees will need a lot of pollen for their growth. If you put a trap on for too long, like four or five days straight, then, then the colony strength will be decreased because they don't have enough pollen to raise those larvae and get to the next stage. So 
So that's important. And then, uh, yeah, it, some pollination scenarios, people have tried to put pollen traps so that they'll make bees have work hard, right? Because they're losing all this pollen in the trap. So now they're not getting enough pollen into the hive. So they know that they need to still work hard. And so, yeah, so you, you could, you could stimulate more foraging, but again, eventually it might be detrimental to the colony if they are trying to do that. Uh, uh, so that's why the whole reason we don't put traps on too long is for the sake of the bee colony health. Uh, but yeah, you can probably get some advantage if you are a, a grower and you want to put traps on for some time, they probably will get, get more pollen because they're trying to meet their needs in the colony. And then one last thing I'll tell about that is bees are pretty intelligent. So when you can see them, so they will start sneaking in smaller loads of pollen. So your mesh may be the size where bee gets in and it drops. But we have seen in our studies is eventually after like a week or so, the bees realize that the pollen loads they're carrying are always going down. So they'll come up with a smaller load, very small load so that they can just sneak in. So, so they can do that as well eventually. Amazing. Okay. Um, when you have to supplement food to your bees, what is best to use, sugar or honey? So honey is always the best source, but I know sometimes you will, uh, because sugar you're providing is table, I mean, your, your cane sugar, which probably you're buying from any of those grocery stores and mixing it or from a bigger supplier. So it only has carbohydrate, right? Only sucrose, which will be eventually broken down into fructose and glucose. But, uh, but other than that, you're missing all the vitamins, minerals that I talked about. So honey is the best source, but again, beekeepers feed sugar only when there is a need. They're not randomly feeding it. They will feed when they want their colonies to go strong in some in spring. And then they also feed them in late fall or fall when there is uh, not much resources coming in because most of the plants have stopped blooming. So now they need additional stores to survive the winter because here in the Pacific Northwest, at least uh, you need about 70 to 80 pounds of honey stores to, to make the hive survive the winter because they will need a lot of energy in the winter because they are using those thoracic muscles to expand and contract to maintain temperatures in the hive. And they have to eat a lot of honey. So again, coming back to your question and making it uh, a little shorter, honey is the best option, but sometimes uh, they may not feed on honey in winter because if the honey is too far on the frames and they're in the middle sometimes, sometimes even beekeepers feed them uh, sugar fondant uh, so that they have easy access just on top of those bars where they are. So again, that's more of a beekeeping question, but yeah, if you are a beekeeper and you're interested in that, you can send me a separate email and I'll be happy to have another discussion. Okay. Yeah. Um, that question was from one and he wanted to also know what ratio, I don't know if that varies by the time of year. Yeah. So usually there is a ratio. If you go to bee schools or attend some extension events where we talk about uh, how to keep bees. And so, so in the, in the spring that we want to stimulate the hives, right? That's why you measure, you, you do one is to one. So one part sugar, one part water. Whereas you go into fall where the bees are in the mode of storing more resources for the winter, then you go two ways to one, the two part sugar, one part water. I know it's hard to mix, but there are ways to do it. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, okay, here's a different question. Um, did I hear you correctly when you said that bees are selective and go to flowers that are higher in sterols when they need them? No, so you heard partly correct, I guess. In the study where I mentioned that we gave them the synthetic diet, uh, they were able to selectively eat more of that, right? Uh, that's why they were. So if I had a, a treatment cage here, which had less sterol and I had another cage here with bees uh, with the higher sterol, so we saw consumption high. So they were more enthused about eating that higher concentration. But in the field, we have what studies have shown at least, and even some of the studies we have done in the past is, uh, bees can recognize the concentration of sugar. They can, they can decipher 10% versus 20% concentration of sugar or 30%. But uh, at least there is good evidence that bees can't detect the concentration of protein or anything in pollen. So they're usually collecting. That's why they randomly collect five different types, hoping that if something is missing in this pollen, it's present in this one. So at least uh, there is no evidence at this time, uh, ro no robust evidence that bees can detect concentrations of sterols in the field for sure. Okay. Um, let's see. Um, we have Donald in Maine. Um, they have a very high 
early amount, uh, an early high amount of evergreen pollen, which then falls off quickly into a dearth of pollens from other taxa. Most beekeepers around there feed the bees a lot of sugar water. Is there another food source that will feed the bees through till the fall crop of flowers and blooms open? I mean, unfortunately, sugar is the only option that beekeepers have. I mean, some commercial beekeepers, they will feed this high fructose corn syrup, which is relatively maybe, I don't know if the prices are very different these days, but uh, it used to be a little cheaper than your regular cane sugar. So they used to go for that. But but I think sugar is your only option. Unfortunately, bees, you can't feed anything else. Uh, uh, yeah, there are some locations uh, like yours where uh, there is not much there for straight three months. And unfortunately, beekeepers... For carbohydrate needs, yeah, they have to feed sugar and they can put some protein if they still think there is some brood rearing going on because bees are looking, the queen looks at a lot of cues, not just the larva present at that time, right? The, the change in temperatures outside, the ambient temperatures, how much pollen is coming in. So there are several cues that queen is looking for either to stop laying eggs completely or slowing down or, or increasing her egg laying rate. So there's some, it's a very uh, complex biology there with uh, in terms of what feedback mechanism that queens have. So if you don't get any pollen, so I don't think they will even eat your protein supplements at the time if they're not raising any brood because the queen has either slowed down. So, so yeah, if you're just asking me a question about sugar solution, unfortunately that's your only option. I don't have any other suggestions on how to keep your bees alive uh, with a carbohydrate resource, but a protein supplement uh, mixed with some pollen would be a great resource if you can buy there are some uh, suppliers or manufacturers, they sell uh, protein supplement mixed with 5 or 10% pollen. So I would recommend using those rather than just pure protein because they don't have any pollen mixed in. And so, so they're missing on those sterols that I talked about before. Okay, yeah, we had a similar question from someone who wanted to know whether um, she can or whether they can collect this type of pollen to supplement bees. Absolutely. So yeah, I yeah I know this was an e-organic webinar. I didn't want to make it a more beekeepers talk here. So okay. so I didn't I didn't talk. But uh, yeah, when I give talks about pollen to beekeepers, I do have a slide where I show them how to trap their own pollen. So you can. So if you have five or six uh, good hives in your backyard, they have to be strong. I never will suggest you to use a pollen trap on a weaker hive and the beekeeper will know what a weaker hive is. You're not having good strength. Maybe there are eight to nine frames of bees. That's a weak hive. If you think there is a hive, which is probably 20 frames of bees on both sides of a frame and they are in a, and, and your time of the year is important. You have to look, you can't trap pollen whenever you want because you will be impacting colony health as well. So you have to look for a time when, and you are the best uh, judge in your area. You know, when there is profuse bloom coming in and you see a lot of pollen foragers coming into the hive with different types of pollen, that's the time when you can put a pollen trap. So there are different types. Uh, there are front porch. You can just put it and screw it in the front. You can find those in uh, bee stores. They're yellow colored. And then you train the bees to get in. So don't allow them directly with the trap on. So what you do is there is an insert with the trap where the mesh is. So you remove that. So it, it, it doesn't come out, but you can just flip it and put a tape. So the bees are going without the mesh for one day and then they still will think uh, our weird beekeeper has put some yellow thing on the outside and I have to go through this. But then uh, once they're trained to go through that for a day, then you drop the uh, screen down. And now next day they'll go through the holes now. So then they will know that this is what they have to do in the next day. And so they're not confused. So it's easy for them. You can train them to go through those things. And before that, I would suggest you to seal any cracks or holes on your hive because bees are pretty good. If you put their entrance trap, then they'll start going from the other holes and then you'll not get enough pollen. So that way you can collect pollen and you don't need tons of it. If you're a small backyard beekeeper with five, 10 hives, I'm looking at maybe even like a few tablespoons would be enough for you to collect from those hives. And then you can put in a Ziploc and store at minus 20 uh, in your freezer somewhere. And pollen has shown to be good quality for a year if you store them properly in a freezer. So you can use it for next year as well. Okay. Um, let's see. So bees don't collect nectar and pollen from only one plant at a time. Um, if so, would that mean that the pollen in the sac could be a mix from two to five plants that they visit each trip? Uh, so with honeybees, uh, if I understand your question, so honeybees are uh, uh, having this very peculiar or unique uh, behavior of uh, floral constancy or flower fidelity, where 
they will collect only that pollen. So if I'm going, I'm a bee, I'm visiting borage or phacelia. So I'll stick to that same because that's more efficient for them, right? If a flower morphology is very different. If suppose there is a blueberry flower with your, uh, with your bell shape and you have an open flower, your cherry or pear, which is more open. So it's easy for them to collect pollen here, right? Than getting into a blueberry flower and struggling and getting on their legs, the pollen. So, so it's more efficient for them to go to the same flower rather than if a bee is trained to get pollen from bumble uh, from from the blueberry, then she'll probably go to that. So, so it's a very efficient way, right? If I ask you to do a, a, a monotonous task, same thing in a day, then it will be very efficient rather than giving you three different things to do, right? So that's an, more of an efficiency that bees have evolved with this millions of years of evolution, uh, evolutionary process. So it's more efficient for them. And it's good for farmers as well, right? As as farmers, we want the bees to go in, be in blueberries, not go to uh, some pear and come back to my blueberry because the pollen is not compatible. So you want them to stick to the same crop as well. So I think in that sense, it's a, it's a real cool uh, foraging behavior. So bees are sticking to, they're not collecting three different pollens. If you're asking me about honeybees, that one forager that is going out today she is sticking to the same species for the entire foraging day until that resource is totally gone. She'll not go from your phacelia to borage and to a blueberry and come back. But there are other bee species. Uh, you can see some native bees do that. They could go to two different resources uh, in the same foraging trip. And that could be a more contaminated pollen. And that's why in this video that I showed you, we are only concentrating on honeybee foragers, pollen foragers, so that uh, there is more of a pure pollen. I would not still say pure because they might have some from other bees that are in the hive that gets on them. And so, it, but at least it would be 90% pure when we do this for our study. Okay. Um, do you know of any research on the nutritional requirements for bombus or mega ch child? Do they differ from honeybees? Is that information known? Yeah, that's a great question. So I don't work with uh, native bees. I'm more of an apiculture person working with honeybees, but I would imagine there are some similar requirements, but given their difference in biology, honeybees being a more of a new social insect and the bumblebees a little semi-social and, and the other native bees solitary. So their requirements might vary a little bit, but I would say the basic ones like crude proteins, amino acids, uh, and to some degree, sterols may vary. I, we don't know yet. So so that's another step. Once we know much about honeybees, I think we may get into some uh, of that research looking at uh, other bees as well. But unfortunately, yeah, uh, there is not real uh, robust information at this time on requirements of bumblebees and other native bees. Okay. Um, is adding probiotics helpful to the hive colony? Uh, probiotics is a very new emerging area. I, I am not discounting that it may not have any impact, but unfortunately I haven't seen any. We have done some preliminary work here at Oregon State University, but I haven't seen anything really significant. But uh, uh, but yeah, we still need, uh, because we still don't even understand the real uh, value of those uh, microbiome that is there in the bee, right? We have this eight core bacterial species and we don't even know exact functions of those. So, so unless we know all that thing, then we'll know if you use some probiotic, uh, there are companies selling it. And uh, I mean, if you want to try, you could, but I would say there is no real uh, scientific evidence at this time that they're doing anything really uh, beneficial to the bee microbiome. Okay. Um, let's see. I think we have time for one or two more questions here. Um, Hannah has heard that honeybees like granite rocks. If you fill a bird water bath with granite rocks, um, what mineral is granite providing? Yeah, so I'm not a geologist, so I don't know. Maybe we should ask some <laughs> geologist, but that's a great question. So yeah, bees look for minerals and yeah, I don't know. Maybe I'll Google after I'm done with this, my webinar, so to see what they are collecting. But if you have any idea, let me know. But just to give you a basic sense, yeah, you'll see bees coming to swimming pool water, right? So they are looking for salts as well. So uh, so that's a sodium chloride probably you're looking or anything like that that is there. So, so yeah, maybe if they're coming to this granite, I'm pretty sure they're looking for a certain mineral, which unfortunately I have no idea at this time. Uh, but yeah, that's, that's what they're probably doing. Okay, um, let's see. I think there's one more question in the queue um, about what meadow foam is. So um, yeah, oh no, mm -hmm. yeah, <laughs> that's yeah. Unless you have lived in Oregon or probably part of Northern California, you don't know. So it's a oil seed crop. It just grows uh, that tall and it blooms mostly in May. It's an oil seed crop. 
So, so, be, so it's only about three to four thousand acres here in Oregon. It's a very speciality crop. Um, so it's used for the oil. The extract is used has a cosmetic value. It is used in some medicines as well, and I think it can be used as a lubricant too. So, so yeah, it's a very interesting. I think limnanthus is the scientific name. Uh, so meadowfoam is very unique. Yeah, it's an oil seed crop. That's why they call them meadowfoam. When it blooms, it looks like a beautiful white foam, like on a meadow. So. Okay, well, thank you. Um, I really appreciate all the questions and active participation of everybody here. And um, I just want to also mention, since someone asked um, whether this webinar was recorded, and it was, and we'll be posting the recording on the eOrganic YouTube channel, as well as on the eOrganic website at eOrganic.org within one to two weeks. So thank you so much, Ramesh, for this really informative presentation. And thanks to everyone today for joining us.